good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here. I'm Ana Garcia Lopez, professor at the, this university, but I'm here to introduce and present Professor Mike Robinson. Uh, Mike Robinson is a professor of cultural heritage at Nottingham Trent University, UK. Before this, he was professor of cultural heritage at the University of Birmingham and director of the Iron Bridge International Institute for Cultural Heritage, which is a partnership with the Iron Bridge Gorge University Trust, Europe's largest independent museum managing the UNESCO Iron Bridge Gorge World Heritage Site. Professor Robinson is Professor Emeritus at the University of Birmingham, and prior to Birmingham University, he was founder and director of the Center for Tourism and Cultural Change at the Universities of Sheffield, Hallam, and Leeds Metropolitan over a 12-year period where he also held research professorship in tourism and culture. Professor Robinson has also held various visiting positions, including the many prestigious university in every continent you uh, will be able to read in, in his uh, bio. He is founder and editor-in-chief of the Journal of Tourism and Cultural Change and founder and co-editor of the Tourism and Cultural Book Series. Uh, working across disciplinary boundaries to generate new thinking, Professor Robinson seeks to translate research and examples of best practice to share with the heritage and tourism sector. He has advised governments, transnational and state organizations, museums and heritage attractions, NGOs and community groups. He has worked on heritage and tourism related projects in over 40 countries and has set new agendas through his publications, creative partnerships, his supervision of more than 30 PhDs and his design and organization of 35 international academic and practitioner conferences. Professor Robinson has held grants from the British Academy, the Arts and Humanities Research Council, the US Social Science Research Council, the EU, and several overseas national funding bodies. As an advisor to the UNESCO World Heritage Program in Sustainable Tourism, he, he was principal consultant to the UNESCO World Heritage European Journey Project. He has also, he was a government appointed member of the UK's expert panel to determine the UK's tentative list for World Heritage and has worked with UNESCO offices in China, Southeast Asia, Central Asia, the Middle East, and various parts of Europe. He works closely with the Council of Europe's Cultural Roots Programme. His research concerns the ways in which societies continually produce both tangible and intangible heritage and the ever-changing ways this heritage is consumed by tourists and local communities. He places emphasis on the shifting values ascribed to heritage and how these shape and inscribe narratives and meanings. He is interested in what heritage does and what it can do. Now it can be mobilized and how it can be mobilized to transform place, people and local economies in sustainable and meaningful ways. The scope of his work stretches from the issues surrounding the sustainability and the changing historic and geographic cultural resonances of war heritage. I will, not, I will not address the books because you can read them. To the emergence of new heritage generated through absorption of popular culture and his work in the field of critical tourism studies continues to assess how we value and understand different forms of heritage in symbolic ways. Uh, you can, um, he has written books like Literature and Tourism, The Reading and Writing of Tourism, Cultural Tourism and Changing World Policies, Participation and Interpretation, and also in an emotional sense with the book Emotion, Emotion, Tourism, Affect and Transformation. We are really thrilled to have Professor Robinson with us today. We welcome here. Thank you very much. Please proceed whenever you want. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anna. And I think the introduction is probably longer than the um, 
my presentation, but um, uh, uh, it's very it's very kind of you to be reminded of things I've forgotten about. Um, and uh, and obviously, I want to thank the uh, the presenters and the organisers of this conference, and I'm very honoured that you uh, decided to invite me. I, I have to say, as an aside, and I'm saying this in a in a in a in, in a sort of a friendly as a friendly critic, when we talk about inter, it's surprising that everybody, the professionals, have gone to a different room. <laughs> Because the whole purpose, I think, of a conference like this is to bring the professionals and the academics together. Now, that's not meant as a, as a, as a, as a deep criticism, it's just as an observation, and I think something that um, we should be aware of. Um, I, I, was, I was intrigued by the, the, um, uh, by the conference title. So I, I guess I'm prompted by the, um, uh, by the provocation, in a sense, um, of the conference. So I want to interrogate this notion of transformation. And I, I, I will address very directly this sort of this pandemic, post-pandemic sort of binary. Um, uh, I have to say that I have been in Granada for the past six days now. I see very little evidence of... Um, <laughs> Of, of, of post pandemic, it's, it, everything is back to normal, it seems. And so, and, and I, I want to say a little bit more about this. Um, the pandemic for me is an unwelcome memory of humanity that has been quickly forgotten. Um, but maybe we should see it as a, as a, as a punctuation in thought. Um, uh, and, and, and at least an opportunity to reflect. That's the least we can do. Um, so in a very short time, I want to reflect on a, a series of themes, which I think for me, sort of at the boundary of, of let's say, sort of critical heritage studies and critical tourism studies are, 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 are something which has emerged in this sort of this pandemic um, a post-pandemic sort of framework. Next slide, please, Tatiana. So these are the themes that um, uh, I just want to reflect upon, and I, I really hope that we can have some discussion at the end of this, uh, of this, this session. Um, the first one is this long-term implications. Now, I don't know what long-term means. Uh, in a sense, but I put it down. The long-term implications of COVID crisis on heritage as the key resource. Now, you know, you you just have to um, uh, wander around Granada uh, and visit the Alhambra to realize if you take the heritage away from the place, there's actually just a, a city where people live and go shopping. So uh, heritage is always at the center um, uh, of what we do as, uh, as tourists. And I want to explore this um, co-dependency and arguably over-dependency of the heritage sector on tourist spending. Um, uh, as somebody who was um, uh, in closely involved in um, uh, the management of a World Heritage Site and 10 museums within the boundaries. I can tell you from a, a, from a, from a pandemic sense, uh, but when you have no visitors, it raises real problems. Um, but I also want to look at this, this notion of how heritage um, is funded and how we can rework that, how we can rethink that, because it's critical. We have to talk about these things. And also, in a more fundamental way, um, how all of this leads us to the reevaluating of heritage, what it is and what we do with it. And I think there's a, there's a parallel sort of track which we need to look at um, uh, as, we, as we go through this. Next slide, Tatiana. So if we go back to those very strange 
changed times of 2020 and 2021, um, uh, which seem a, a long time ago now. Um, these are some of the sort of the, the, the headlines, and I have sort of collected a mass of headlines from the, from the period um, relating to the sort of the COVID crisis and how it was impacting um, different forms of heritage sites. Um, uh, and these were, when I say headlines, these were headlines. These were the front pages of, of well-known newspapers and, uh, and news reports. Um, uh, Vienna's Al Albertina losing 1.6 million in income a month. The Metropolitan Museum of Art lost 81 employees in its visitor services. I understand about half have been re replaced now. Um, uh, Cleveland Museum of Art in the US, a third of employees. Venice, I talk a, quite a bit about Venice because it's worth talking about um, uh, probably over a billion euros in lost revenue. Um, 10,000, 10,000 of the population there furloughed um, uh, in, the in the hotel sector. Um, a major attraction, Angkor Wat, Cambodia, 76% loss in tourist revenue. Um, uh, and a site which I, I know very well, and I work, well, I'm still working there, um, Petra, the um, World Heritage Site in, in the south of Jordan. Um, uh, the, the, the nearby town to Petra is Wadi Musa. And, um, and I can tell you there were near riots when Petra was closed because of the hyper dependency upon tourists to that that, that, that place Wadi Musa would not exist as a place if it was not for tourists visiting the World Heritage Site. That's a very, very direct relationship. Um, uh, next slide. So suddenly in all of this, our perspectives changed quite dramatic and it's a, it was a strange world in a sense because um, for many years we've been talking about over tourism and the influx of mass tourists um, uh, and here you had the same destinations and the same organizations which are complaining about this saying we want our tourists back, wish, we wish the tourists were here, not we wish you were here, we wish the tourists were here. Um, uh, and it was a very particular time. And uh, I found myself, um, and I'm sure some of you did as well, in places um, uh, which still remained open, maybe at the, sort of the beginning and the tail end of, of, of the of COVID crisis, not within sort of lockdown. Um, uh, a colleague of mine was at the Alhambra and there was hardly anybody there. I mean, he had the whole place almost to himself. So you had this very strange, almost post-apocalyptic sort of um, uh, perspective, which you were given. And UNESCO um, uh, had an emergency meeting of um, uh, ministers of culture in 2020. I think in September 2020, um, uh, and basically, if you and you can read the text of the of, of, of the meeting, um, they didn't know what to do. They were fairly helpless. Now, in a sense, tourism is not the the remit of UNESCO, but the reality of of, of the heritage and the protection of the heritage. Um, uh, was also hitting home. And again, this intimacy, this dependency upon tourists, I, I think started to hit home very dramatically. Um, uh, and if you visit the, the, the UNESCO site, um, uh, the website, which is an amazing website, um, you start to see the pattern um, uh, where a majority of the then about 1,100 World Heritage Sites were actually closed off um, to the public. Um, uh, and this was unheard of. So what do you do about it? Um, uh, well, you, you make good noises, you make good intentions, um, uh, but very little you can actually do about it. it was a, there was a helplessness. Next slide, please. So here we are back in Venice. 
and this man appears to have mastered the art of visitor management, I think, um, uh, in excess. Um, uh, but again, you know, <laughs> this is a, um, in just about every text on sustainable tourism, Venice is the sort of the exemplar of over tourism. Um, uh, and um, uh, very interesting uh, case to, to, to look at. Uh, next slide, please. I mean, this photograph was taken at the beginning of 2019 in Venice. And um, uh, these are the local residents of Venice protesting uh, too many tourists um, uh, coming into Venice. And, and quite, quite rightly, I mean, there are major issues surrounding this. Major issues, uh, and you know there are similar there are similar photographs in some in, in places like Barcelona. Barcelona was a, a quite aggressive anti tourist anti tourism campaigns, and in other parts of the world. This is not um, uh, uh, limited to, to to Europe. But we move from this to next one to this unprecedented even in times of war. Now, I have a very precious photograph of my father during the Second World War sitting on the steps of St. Mark's um, uh, and um, uh, surrounded by lots of people in, in 1944. Um, uh, and so this, is, this was just unprecedented. We've never seen anything like this. It's very difficult, I think, it will be a difficult process of communication in the future to, even with images like this, and there are plenty of images like this, um, to communicate this to future generations. Well, we don't have to communicate this in the same way, but it's, um, it's instructive. Next slide, please. So when we look at the impact, that should say impact on heritage sites at the, the top of the page there, um, there were, of course, there was, of course, considerable variation, not only um, as a function of how the pandemic hit different parts of the world and different continents, different countries and um, different regions, but in terms of the type of heritage um, uh, which was impacted. Um, and not surprisingly, um, uh, let's say the more sort of natural heritage, the cultural landscapes, the more open, physically open sites, um, we were able to sort of to manage the process um, uh, uh, much better. Um, uh, but nevertheless, a dramatic drop in tourist revenue, um, direct revenue in terms of entrance fees, etc. Um, uh, but also what's you know what what's interesting but also more difficult to, to measure in terms of visitor spend um uh, on local communities and, and, and within the wider destination and how those two are, are linked and again you know you can go to the UNWTO website and you can see the graphs with the with the dramatic slope of decline of visitor numbers whether you do that um, uh, internationally, or whether you do it by nation, but you just see this massive sort of slide, this massive um, uh, steep line. What this also meant as well was a decreased um, number of staff were working within these heritage sites. Now, you know, this prevented uh, certain things happening. And, and again, I, I can speak from um, uh, experience. Um, uh, um, the World Heritage Site of Ironbridge Gorge, um, uh, well, the Museum Trust um, uh, employs about 246 people. Uh, did employ 246 people, um, uh, many of which were just involved in the day-to-day -day maintenance of buildings. I mean, this is an industrial site and a cultural landscape, and so you, you couldn't afford to pay anybody to do this. You know, you couldn't. People couldn't move. So. Um, um, so all of these things, the you know, the monitoring of site um, conditions, remedial work, um, in some parts of the world, you have people preventing illegal activity of stealing antiquities. Um, uh, all of these things sort of were, were, were happening. 
again, in various, in various, various ways and at various levels. And at the same time, it didn't mean that you stopped paying maintenance costs. Your maintenance costs went up, in a sense. Um, uh, if ever, I mean, you know, I'm sort of semi-retired now, so I work from, from home a lot. And my, of course, my electricity bill goes up <laughs> when you work at home. You know, all your, all your bills go up. And it was exactly this, it's been exactly the same for her. He said, she can't stop um, uh, the ongoing maintenance of, 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 of some of these buildings, particularly where you have very fragile heritage resources. And then the, more, the one which is sort of more difficult to, um, uh, to calculate um, uh, is the, again, this long-term decrease in the spending al allocations, um, which I think is still, uh, it's, it's just still happening. Um, um, and particularly amongst the public sector. Um, uh, and when you look at EU spending on, on culture, um, across the EU, it's generally very, very high. But of course, culture is one of those budgets which are the first budgets to cut if you're in times of crisis. You know, where is the emphasis of your um, uh, of your spending? Your, spe your spending goes on health, education, the roads, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And culture and heritage it comes lower down. Um, and it's in the, I, 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 within the, in the EU, it is even though it has gone up as a sort of a, as a sort of a financial package for the heritage sector and the wider cultural sector, it remains lower than, than, than pre-pandemic uh, within, within the European Union. Um, so these impacts uh, bring to light, I think, a series of, of systemic problems. And, and, and again, the, the, the word systemic is important here. So next slide, please, Tabby. Because it's what it did, and, 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 and I think this is where, um, again, I, I'm still working through this myself, through various projects in various ways, but uh, it exposed a lot of cracks, cracks in our system. And it did reveal these intimate dependencies, core dependencies between the heritage and the tourism sector. And, um, uh, and on a national level, um, uh, it revealed an over-dependency on tourism as a foreign income generator. If you take the case of the country of Jordan, Jordan depends 14% 14, 14 of its GDP is tourism related, 14%. You take that away and there's you know, no wonder there's people getting very upset about it, you know? Same in places like Cambodia, same in places where you have, particularly in the sort of the more developing world, where you have this very strong dependency of, um, of, of, of basically sort of incoming um, dollars into the economy. What I also think this reveals is an over-dependency of the heritage sector on public subsidy. Because again, you know, I, I work with I work with many museums um, uh, and, and and sites across Europe, and um, uh, and they've, they've, most of them, I won't say all of them, but a big majority of them are, are almost fully funded through the public sector, through the, through the municipality, and the state directly, Ministry of Culture. But of course, as priorities change with the pandemic so were the budget reduced. And that was, you know, so how does it, just like a business, how do you, you know, how do you respond? Well, the first thing you do is you put staff, because staffing is your biggest cost. Hence, you get this decrease in staffing working in the heritage sector. Um, and in, in countries like the UK, which has a very uh, limited, actually, compared to most of you, uh, uh, so compared to most of Europe, you, you do know I'm, I'm speaking as an outsider here, unfortunately, you know, but you can't, you can't avoid the rhetoric. But, um, um, but anyway, we, we've always had, the UK has always had a very um, uh, um, uh, less dependency on the public sector for funding its heritage. And it relies heavily on fundraising, uh, donors, direct uh, income from tourists 
um, uh, and on, on a massive volunteer um, sector, massive volunteer sector within the heritage, uh, the heritage world. And again, that was hit as well. That exposed the sort of the, um, uh, because no tourists, no funding. Um, the 10 museums within Ironbridge Gorge World Heritage Site um, uh, uh, never received any public funding since, uh, well, never, since its inception in 1967. So everything is, de is developed on the back of, of tourists spent and any income you can, um, you, you can make. What it also does, and again, this is not news, certainly not news to me, um, uh, is it revealed the lack of business strategy, the lack of strategy generally, thinking long-term, uh, how you sort of, um, uh, um, the word resilience was used this morning, how you, you make yourself resilient because nobody could foresee the extent of the, um, of the crisis. But nevertheless, um, um, uh, the lack of contingency planning, the lack of creativity in dealing with crisis, that, re that is something which is part and parcel, I, I think, of the heritage sector. And again, links to the dependency on public sector funding, because you know, if you're going to get paid by the government all the time, you're going to get your money, well, why, why should you be so creative? You know? Uh, so these are some of the, um, uh, the, the cracks in the, in, the, in the system. Next slide. Uh, and, and again, the strap line at the top here, which you can't see, it says the digital distraction. Because one of the, one of the responses was, okay, we'll go digital. And, and this was one of the responses of the, of the ministries, of ministers of culture that UNESCO convened. And says, okay, we're going to put sites online. You can have virtual tours of world heritage sites. Um, uh, and of course, you know, museums are already doing that, put their collections online, making things virtual. So, you know, it's not difficult if you want to um, explore the um, uh, you know, Museum of Metropolitan Art in, in, in New York. You can go online, you can see the collections, etc. Why leave your armchair, you know? So this is, you know, and this is a reasoned response, but it's a distraction. Partly because, again, it's not bringing any extra income. It's not bringing the tourists, you know, again, the, the, the um, um, director of internationalization this morning mentioned the importance of us being physically together, you know, um, uh, there's no substitute. And actually what you see and what you have seen, this is an additional spend for very limited return. Now, I happen to work um, uh, with um, very good uh, colleagues, and we, we do a lot in digital heritage, artificial intelligence, and uh, virtual reality, um, um, the field of um, uh, cultural heritage. But it's all on top spending. And the, the return you get from that is actually quite limited, the financial return. The experience I, I get, you know, great to be able to see, you know, great works of art in, in, in you know, in the museum in Tokyo by, by a click of the button, but it doesn't do anything, you know, for, it doesn't increase intercultural dialogue, it doesn't bring your income. So I, I see it as a distraction. Now, next slide, please, Tatiana. Going back to headlines, we have these bounce back headlines um uh, and so again it's this short memory that we've all got um uh, and these are just a, a, a sample again that i'm starting to collect these bounce back headlines so again the french tourism bounces back after two years of COVID hit summers okay yes you can see that tourism Italy bounces back strongly exceeding exceeding pre-pandemic levels you know, and everybody's happy about it. Fantastic. Tourism in Asia is bouncing back. Can the rebound survive a global recession? This is this is this is more realistic in a sense because what we've done is we've come out of one crisis and we've moved into another crisis without really wondering where we where the boundary is between. Um, now again, 
it depends where you are in the world, it depends where you stand and how you're looking at this. Um, uh, if you look at the recent meeting, which was um, uh, held at UNWTO, UNWTO suggests tourism on track for full recovery, a strong start to 2023, but with a word of caution, of course, there's, there's a recession. Inflation is, 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 is rising. Um, uh, you know, travel is more expensive. You know, we have a war going on. Sadly, you know, we have fuel crises. It's a whole raft of things when you put together. This is all bound up within this, um, uh, this, um, these headlines. Next uh, slide, Catherine. So I took this photograph in October last year in Venice compared to the, so again, business as usual, yes? Business as usual. Well, again, the, the, the strap line at the top says Venice, continued complexities and dilemmas. And Venice is an interesting case for the, maybe not, you have to dig a bit deeper than saying, oh yes, over tourism, it's terrible what's happened to Venice. I mean, um, uh, approximately, I mean, Venice now is a, as a, as a, I mean, it has decreased dramatically um, uh, by well over half uh, in, in the past um, 50 years. But uh, for the, the core population of 50,000 in Venice, about 60% of those are, are, are involved in some way in tourism businesses. So you can understand they welcomed the tourists coming back to Venice. Now it's a complicated situation and of course you've, you've seen these incredible cruise liners and the lagoon and the, 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 the causing, you know, they cause environmental damage and again they've been prevented now. Um, they've got a moor outside the lagoon. Um, uh, but you know, the, 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 the port um, uh, I think provides jobs for about 4% of the Venice population. And the irony is, Venice is building cruise liners just around the corner. <laughs> and so, and so, you're, yeah, so it's a not in my backyard situation. Now, again, there's no easy answer to this. All of this is quite rational, depending on which way, which way you look at it. Um, but it just seems, uh, and, and just, I was there for the Biennale, and just, I'm thinking, you know, everybody has just got a short memory, you know? I've got a short memory, you know, the locals have got a short memory, the tourists have got a short memory, as is nothing had happened. But I think, you know, there are things which have happened. Slide there, everyone. And these are these sort of longer term um, uh, problems. And one of, the, one of the unknowns, but I mean, it's uh, in terms of the exact figures, just don't know, but um, effectively, whatever vast amounts of money went into um, uh, ameliorating the effects of the pandemic are not going to be borne by this generation. It's in the next generations to come. That's, this is a, this is terrible. I mean, you know, I mean, I'm not going to be paying. We're all paying for it in a sense, but it's in the future. Um, um, and that's going to have an impact on, on heritage and cultural sector uh, funding, undoubtedly. The, 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 the overall level is just going down, down, down. And despite many, <laughs> despite many, many conferences and many discussions, we are still to uh, nail these practical mechanisms for this feedback of tourist income back into the heritage sector. Because what happens is you, you, the money is generated and it goes straight to government usually, you know, and then it's government filters it back to the heritage sector and it doesn't always sort of come back in the same way. Um, it comes back to a much reduced rate. Um, and we still really haven't got those mechanisms right, but I think we need to think again very quickly. And I have to say, as somebody who works with the heritage sector on a day-to-day -day basis, there's still a culture of denial that tourists are somehow different to us. You know, um, we were, you know, I run a museum. That this is commercial. 
you know, um, uh, I should be funded. You know, I, 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 there's no automatic notion of this really. Um, uh, and there's very limited dialogue still between those within the heritage sector and I, I, I let, let me extend that to the culture and the arts sector and the tourism sector. Hence, my first comment is, why aren't the professionals in the room? You know, because that's what we need to be thinking about. And also, and again, this is this is something for um, uh, for for understanding the tourist, which is what I've been trying to do for the last um, forty years plus of my life. Um, uh, um, it's trying to rethink the relationships between the tourist and heritage. And I, I, this is a line I, I used in a, in a, in a book on heritage and popular culture. Um, because what the tourist, today's tourist, understands as heritage is different to what tourists before would understand from heritage. And I think that is fascinating and challenging in equal part. Um, uh, and tourists are tap into, I don't mean mass in terms of numbers, I'm to, in terms of mass culture, popular culture, you know. And what, what we might call sort of heritage of the recent past, you know. Um, uh, just as important, you know, because there's a connection, you know. And also something which has a personal connection, which relates to me. You just have to look at your television screens to see these um, um, programs or adverts, which 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 tell you how you can trace your family lineage back. You know, um, uh, what did your father do in the war? What did your grandfather do in the war? These very personal tropes which come through, and it changes the way that we sort of uh, uh, we've widened the pool of heritage in a sense. Um, and it changes the way that we relate to our past. Um, and again, the emotions, uh, the emotional contact is important. I, I you know, visiting the Al Alhambra is incredible as a spectacle, as a sight. Do I have an emotional connection to it? No. It could do with it. Not my culture, so my, 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 you know, it, it, but it's still, it's still beautiful, you know. Next slide, please, Tatiana. So, you know, we need to better understand these changing meanings that heritage sites have for tourists. And it's surprisingly, we're surprisingly light on really good research which is doing this. And so I, I, I talk about this re-narrativization of heritage sites for tourist audiences. Now, this is, a, again, this is Dubrovnik. Um, uh, um, uh, and it's a world heritage city, and you know it attracts lots of tourists and it attracts cruise liners, etc. Um, a significant percentage of the tourists who go there don't even know it's a world heritage site. They don't know it's been labelled by UNESCO. And then another significant percentage recognise it as being in the Game of Thrones, yeah. not as you know. The main, what the meanings of heritage. So the interpretation of the heritage which exists is really not speaking to the sorts of visitors that, that come there. Now, whether it should or not is a debate, is a discussion. But again, these, this re-narrativization, which is being done by the tourist, not by the heritage sector. Next slide, please. Now, I always have a problem when I talk about the sort of the reproduction of heritage, what slide to put up on, on. So I just put a slide of rabbits because they seem to embody the, the notion of reproduction. Um, uh, and, and, and I would say sort of the overproduction, the overproduction of heritage. Um, there is more heritage in the world today than there was yesterday. From next month after the UNESCO World Heritage Committee meeting in Riyadh and Saudi Arabia, there will be more World Heritage sites than there were now. Every time there are more museums in the world than there were 30 years ago. 
you know, it goes on and on and on. And of course it does, because it's a continuation. You know, this is a historical continuation. But the problem is, how do we make that clear? Because as the, as the, as the amount of heritage sites, as the number of her, as heritage increases, the resource decreases. It's very competitive now to get funding for heritage. You know, it's always, and it's also competitive for tourists. You want more tourists because that is the source of income. So it's a sort of a, um, <coughs> um, a very sort of vicious circle in a way, um, which is, and again, I've got no real answers to it. You can't stop people inventing and producing heritage because it's important to them. But we have to find a smart, smarter way of sort of dealing with it um, uh, and understanding it. So um, uh, again, this word transformation, which was, which was in the title, and again, it's been referred to this morning. Um, I'm never quite sure what transformation means because transformation does it mean sort of changes at the margin or does it radical overhaul, you know, radical change. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm suggesting that heritage, uh, the sector is living beyond its means um, and that we need more creative engagement certainly between the cultural and heritage sector and tourism business, the business end, the commercial end. It's not a dirty word, it's, it's there, it always has been there. Um, and how that relates to the, uh, a, a, a closer articulation, a closer alignment, if you like, between the shifting trends and, uh, and preferences and market preferences and values of the tourists understanding what heritage is and what people want from it. So this is a more instrumentalist view of heritage, where heritage is actually mobilized. This is from, um, uh, we had a new king crowned not that long ago. Um, uh, and what was fascinating for me was the way that they used the, the royal heritage, the Windsor Castle, um, uh, was transformed into a giant screen. And, and, and I, I just thought that sort of typified a sort of a more creative use of, of the castle rather than just looking at a, a, a wall. And it's, again, it's, it's, there are many examples like this. Um, but it's a much more sort of, you know, instrumentalist sort of view uh, of how we could use, um, a, 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 how we can use heritage. And um, and again, some more radical um, uh, suggestions for transformation of heritage um, uh, in the heritage sector, um, uh, and some are underway. Um, and uh, you know, I I've argued and will continue to argue that there needs to be more consolidation within the museum sector. How many museums can we bet? Uh, you know. Surely there's a case for some vertical integration, you know, so rather horizontal integration between different museums, as, as, has, as has happened in the tourism business, as has happened in most businesses. Um, uh, it's not devaluing the objects. It's just finding a, a, a you know, sustainable way of presenting them in a way. Um, uh, I'm uh, very much an advocate for integrating collections, museum collections within communities. You know, so, you know, releasing the objects from the prism and the prism of the um, of the museum in back into the community, let people take control of the of, of the objects. I have to say, it doesn't go down too well with some of my colleagues, but, you know, I'm still sort of pushing this. Um, adaptive reuse of sites, which is a big issue. Um, and, I mean, this is a, a wonderful example. Um, uh, this is in uh, Jodhpur and... Um, uh, in, in India, and this is the Umayyad Bawan Palace, and um, this would have been destroyed if it hadn't been turned into a massive hotel. Now, actually, Spain was a trailblazer in this with Parados many years ago, 
um, uh, and the development of paradors, you know, hotels with these, these fantastic pieces of architecture, changing the use, um, but retaining the heritage. Now, there are issues around this in terms of interpretation, in terms of access, all I think are, 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 are solvable. And what I call, and again, this is um, something, again, what I call palliative care for heritage. We just let it die. <laughs> You know, we we'll just we'll let just just let it fade away. You know, forget about it. Just let it disintegrate. Um, why do we have to preserve everything? You know, I mean, there are. I mean, we can have a really interesting sociological discussion on why we do this. Um, but anyway, it's um, uh, it's something we may have we may have to do. You know, uh, I always make that, and and I, I I I this is a very personal um, reflection. Well, my father had dementia, um, uh, and I looked after him for eight years. And it wasn't the person who I knew. knew. And I would struggle every day with saying, "Do I keep this person?" And, and people have found, they didn't do it. you know, what's the quality of life for my father? You know, and it came to the end bit when it was really bad, and I had to make a decision. You know, do I keep keep on going? You know. It, it, my her my personal hurry is I keep on going out a better place, you know. And so these 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 are the sort of the uh, on a and it's a strange it's a strange anecdote in a sense, but I see it as very very similar with the hurry set. Just just let it fade away, let it let dust take over. And also and, and and selling things, you know. I mean again, dirty word in heritage, um, but you know. It's a way of, of, of dealing with these things. This, this to me, <clears throat> is a more radical, let's say, a transformation. And all of this, in a sense, is a debate which was pre-pandemic. Pre-pandemic. But I think we can think about the pandemic and this post-pandemic as a way of sort of just reflecting a little bit more and using this sort of reflection on the pandemic as we have saying, okay, how do we deal with these things in the, in the future? So I leave you with um, uh, um, uh, uh, an advert. <laughs> if anybody fancies a pile of stones, um, uh, you have to remove them yourself, I, I'm told. But, um, uh, but anyway, um, uh, I think there might be a good idea. So I uh, finished there and I um, uh, thank you for your time and I'm very happy to be here.